Living Waters presents On the Box. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of On the Box. It is Monday. This is not Ray Comfort. This is Stuart Scott, affectionately known around the ministry as I Scotty. Have a mustache? You do. You have more than a mustache. He's Ray 2.0. Ray 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing this morning, Scott? I'm doing great. Good. We got Scotty Glad on for a, a special segment today. Uh, he's been uh, looking at a book called The Exodus Case. He's very yeah. interested in the Exodus. And uh, so we're going to try to have a reoccurring segment with Scotty, uh, maybe once a week, maybe once every other week, where he gives us an update on the things that he is learning about the Exodus. Very fascinating stuff. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Chad, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing very, very good today. Today's a special day. Why is today a special day? It's my four-year birthday as a Christian. Ah, well, happy birthday. Yeah, happy rebirthday. Ago. An afternoon. Four, and you just celebrated your biological birthday, what, last week? Yeah, right? that one's not important, though. That was <laughs> this no. is the important one. There you go. Uh, we spent a little time out at Cerritos College uh, this morning uh, getting some uh, footage for Season 5 of The Way of the Master. And uh, we were answering a question that came in uh, via email about how to use the optical illusion as a transition. And so we'll hopefully have some video for you about that tomorrow. Uh, today's giveaway is Thousands, Not Millions by Dr. Don DeYoung. Uh, that book is courtesy of Master Books, a division of New Leaf Publications. Uh, if you would like to win one of the three copies that we're giving away today, please email us at onthebox at livingwaters.com. Onthebox at livingwaters.com. Send uh, your full name, your full address. Please try to only enter once. Uh, Ron Love, the adult in the uh, ministry, is going to be picking three folks at random. Dad. Uh, Dad, yeah. <laughs> We call him Father. Well, oh, no, no, come on now. <laughs> Just kidding. Come on He's now. the one where we get in trouble with, and that's yeah, why we call him. Well, you know, office. there was that, there was that day, there was that day when Scotty was minding his own business, uh, for the most part, and we came in with this giant rubber band ball. Yep. That Joel, one of our uh, customer service reps upstairs, has been working on for I don't know four or five years, and this it's thing, big. It, it's about the size of a size and weight of a bowling ball. And I went upstairs <laughs> one day. And I'd seen that bowling ball every day, but something just struck me about that bowling ball. And, and I looked at Joel and I said, we need to bounce that thing. And I didn't want to miss it. Yeah, and Joel, it's a good thing. And Joel, Joel, uh, Joel said, can we? And I made the executive decision, probably the wrong one, to say, yes, let's do that. And so we went uh, to the patio, which is on the second floor of the building, mm -hmm. and we bounced it once. And uh, before we did that, we came to your office and said, Scotty, Scotty, let's get some B-roll of this. And no, you were busy. You had things to do. You were acting all grown up and everything. And, and we couldn't get you out of your office. Uh, but something tugged on your heartstrings. Yeah. And you eventually came outside. We bounced it once. It worked. We figured, well, we got to bounce it higher this time. Bounced it the second time. It came down, hit a planter, and went directly through Scotty's plate glass window at his window. office. Bounced around $30,000 worth of camera equipment. That's right. And, uh, and so we're standing out. We're filled, st my, filled my desk with, with glass. glass. And so we're, sta we're, st we're standing around with our mouths agape like 10-year-old boys. You know, we just got our hands Couldn't called. Couldn't believe it, right. And who comes walking down the stairs but Ron? Ron doesn't have a smile on his face. He has no affect on his face whatsoever. And uh, he's trying to go into Scotty's office. And I said, you really don't need to go in there. There's <laughs> nothing going on in there. There's nothing you need to see. And he just looked at me and said, you will have it fixed today. Yes. And Doctor, you did. Dr. Love. I can't read that. My to glasses you, it says. To Dr. you. Dr. Love to you. I can Dr. see that Love. all the way here from Dr. the foxhole across wow. the street. From that point on, he <laughs> got <it> called dad. <laughs> yeah. And the way he came down was just like dad. Yeah. So. He is the grown up. All right. Let's get started. Uh, Scotty, tell us a little bit. Uh, mo most of our viewers know who you are. They've seen you on um, yeah. season four of uh, The Way of the Master. Mm. Uh, but let our viewers know a little bit about yourself, and then we'll jump right into it. Uh, well, I've been with the ministry since, uh, I guess, about 2004. And um, saw Ray Comfort doing open air at Third Street, and nothing's been the same since. <laughs> But and so I've always been uh, involved in open air and all of that. But Tony and Chad pretty well have that covered, the apologetics and stuff. And we're and learning Tony from you every day, Scotty. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> well, Tony uh, uh, invited me on the show, and so I'm really excited to be here. It's uh, really neat. Uh, but I didn't know what I was going to talk about, and then he asked me a question. He said, uh, "So what are you studying?" 
and boy, my eyes lit up because I've just really been overtaken with some of the thoughts of what I've been looking at lately. And this was a, a book that Ray had lent me. I, it's called The Exodus Case. And of course, it's the, it surrounds the Exodus. And this guy, Dr. Leonard Moeller, who is a medical re researcher, actually in DNA research, um, took time off and with his scientific approach, uh, developed the Exodus case. And the reason it's called the Exodus case is because it's like a court case. Let's look at the evidence and see, see what jives. And that if the Bible were um, a real document, uh, you could follow it like a travel log. So that's what he did. He took the Bible at its word and some of uh, the works of Josephus, who, by the way, and I didn't realize before, has quite a few things to say about this uh, subject, and went through all these places. He went to all these places and made some amazing discoveries. There's a lot there that we can see to verify the things uh, that are in the Bible. And suddenly it began to come alive to me. I read, a f uh, you know, I skipped uh, one part and I read a few pages and, and I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. Then I looked at another part and then I began to realize that this uh, was giving me a, a reality check of what it was really like in some of these situations. And now I've gone back to the beginning and I'm not skipping a page. So uh, now we've got, a, we've got a picture of the area. Yeah. Uh, you want to share a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, real quickly, uh, it, if, um, uh, yeah, it's, coming. It, it's, uh, it's just an overview from Google Maps. The big green area that you see on your left there is the um, uh, uh, Egyptian Delta or the Nile Delta. And that green area, it looks so fertile. Well, that's the land of Goshen. And that was the best part where the Israelites grew and became so populous. There was, by the time they exited, something like two million plus people. <laughs> I mean, that in itself is mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. And uh, they crossed the Sinai and uh, crossed the Red Sea and all of that. And it, so it diverts from the traditional uh, Mount Sinai area, and it has very good reason for doing so. And in the process of looking at all of this, it it becomes extremely fascinating. It's like putting flesh on the bones, so to speak. It's really uh, quite striking. If I asked you a question, if I said, uh, would you like to see a picture of Moses? I mean, would you be interested in that? Would you like to see a picture of Joseph? Uh, you know, would you like to know where they crossed the Red Sea? And, and that's what intrigued me. Yeah. And, and it's really become something that I... Uh, can't wait to get back to. Yeah. Let's show that uh, graphic of the book cover. Again, it is The Exodus Case by Dr. Lamart Moeller. Uh, it's available at uh, Amazon.com and uh, uh, other outlets such as that online. Uh, it is a little bit of a, a pricey book, but I tell you what, if this it was is. a textbook at a university, it would cost three times hmm. uh, what they're asking for it online. But it's a, it's a gorgeous book, uh, well put together, a lot of uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, pictorial images and what have you, and and so we're going to have you back on from time to time to, to give us uh, an update as to what you're learning. And well, I'll try to keep you excited about yeah. it, as excited as I am. Okay. It's pretty neat. All right, let's go to the uh, mailbag. This first one's from Michael. And before I uh, read this one, it's a little lengthy. I um, want to take a moment to mention what happened in Japan this last week. Of course, everyone is, uh, uh, everyone's aware of the 9.0 earthquake that hit uh, literally 8,000 times greater than the massive earthquake that hit New Zealand uh, not too long ago, uh, and equally as, as uh, uh, greater than uh, what hit here in Northridge in 94. It's hard to imagine, you know, living in earthquake country here in Southern California and, and being here for a couple of pretty good-sized quakes, to imagine being in one that was 8,000 times greater than uh, than what we experienced. We have a friend in New Zealand who wrote, and she described it like being uh, put in a tin can and shaken around. And you know, we've never experienced anything like that. Right. Not, a, a not with our biggest earthquakes. And yeah. uh, 
So this was the, uh, in Japan, that was, I think, the fifth largest earthquake ever, ever, recorded, ever recorded in recorded. history. Yeah. And it certainly was the biggest one ever recorded in Japan. Yeah, and it struck in an area and a country that is probably the most prepared country in the world right. uh, for and earthquakes. Still. And but yet the devastation is just on a massive scale, not only from the earthquake, but the uh, multiple tsunamis that have, have hit. The videos are up on YouTube. It's just... Uh, it's getting worse yeah. the, as time goes on. So, so we need to be praying. We need to be praying for the people of Japan. Uh, we need to be praying for uh, the church, uh, uh, Christ's bride in Japan. It's a, it's a small segment of the, of the bride of Christ there in Japan, but they've got a lot of work to do. Uh, ministries are mobilizing all over the world to come you know to aid. An another real important point is both of those earthquakes were on the circle of fire, which is uh, you know the Pacific plate. Well, so are we. Yeah, well, and, and they, in fact, uh, as if an earthquake and tsunamis weren't enough, a volcano erupted in the southern part of Japan wow. you know, yesterday, day before yesterday. So and it, it's hard to imagine how much force was generated, but Japan is now literally eight feet closer to the United States than it was before the earthquake. I mean, can you ima I've and the God who created it all is infinitely more powerful than what we have seen uh, transpire around the globe here. Yeah. 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 All right. So Michael uh, sends us this from the mailbag. It's been several years now that I've been struggling alongside a few friends for a few years at my church to get the church interested in personal evangelism, evangelism with little to no results. Um, I've hosted a Conquer Your Fears and Share Your Faith course, as well as a five-week Sunday school uh, course on evangelism, and have had uh, minimal interest. Uh, the leadership, for the most part, didn't come to those classes and do not exhort evangelism from the pulpit. I recently had a talk with one of the deacons, and he basically said that my friends and I witness to strangers because we have the gift of evangelism. Therefore, those who stay home and or quote-unquote plant seeds with people they know are doing the standard work of evangelism. And I shouldn't expect others to do the things the same way I do. Uh, the leadership is, in, is on the one hand saying that I shouldn't risk making people feel bad, for not making evangelism a priority, but are just fine with rebuking the church for not being involved in quote-unquote social justice. So he's asking how he should deal with that. Uh, how does this tie to Japan? He adds this PS, if you folks could pray for me and my wife, we're headed back to Japan as long-term missionaries and do very much intend on teaching biblical evangelism to the church in Japan. Would you please keep us in prayer in mm -hmm. regards to visas, things going smoothly, uh, and what have you. So... Yeah, that their is from ministry Mike. there. Yeah. yeah. So, Scotty, what would you? Uh, we've we've heard this before. Uh, some yeah. refer to it as club frustration. I don't particularly care for that term, but um, but we hear a lot of people like Michael who are frustrated yeah. with their churches. Oh well, Ray warned me about it the minute I I uh, started hanging around him, and because I uh, had taken the book and uh, gave it to all my leadership, you know. And I was so excited about uh, the information that was in it and getting it into the hands of the leadership. <coughs> but you cannot, um, or you're going to have a struggle pulling unripe fruit from the tree. And you have to rely on God. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like evangelism. Uh, you don't want to do your evangelism based on the response that you get because you're going to feel like a failure most of the time. Amen. And so uh, you've decided that this is right, so you go forward, and, and that's what you do. And whether it's with a church and the church body or whether it's your personal evangelism, you go out and do what God has called you to do. And your example will probably, it, it seems to me, is the, is the greatest uh, incentive for others to come around. When I do open air in my area, uh, the people that have come out and supported me, none of them were from my church. Mm -hmm. They were all people yeah. that realized the gospel was being spoken openly and started coming back and realized they had a place to share their faith when they felt like it. And so uh, consistency is another key to be doing it regularly so people know that you're going to be there and that they can go whenever they feel like it. Yeah. And so don't, you know, let all that go and just uh, uh, stay the course. You know, uh, I think a lot of people have the misperception that all of us here at Living Waters, we're surrounded by evangelists when we hit the street, that there are just droves of Christians mm -hmm. wanting to come and do evangelism with us. Now, you know, Ray and, and you and, and Chad are, are blessed out at Huntington Beach. It's uh, well known yeah. that you guys are out there, and Christians do come. 
But most of us here in the building, when we go out, we go out alone. Yeah, and you did for years out in front of the movie I theater. Still you're there by <laughs> yourself. Yeah. You know, so yeah, your advice is is right on the mark. You know, you got to persevere. Yeah. Don't uh, uh, don't quit. Chad, what do you think? Well, number one, scripture tells you to, you know, it's the Great Commission and that go into the world and preach the gospel to every, you know, creature wasn't just to the apostles. If you think about it, why were Christians persecuted uh, to begin with early on if, you know, they were just closet Christians and kept to themselves? That's not really the case. If you look at a guy like Stephen, the apostles, or the disciples, when they're going out there, I mean, they're being stoned and left for dead thrown into jails, you know, how could we not proclaim the gospel? It's the good news, and if you really believe what Jesus has to say, I mean, consider it, I think it's in Matthew 7, where he talks about how there's a wide road that, lead, that's, uh, that leads to destruction. It's, it's a very wide path, and many are on it. Now, if you're a Christian and you believe that, then you're looking around in, at a world that's drowning, uh, literally, in an eternal sense. Uh, how could you just turn a blind eye and, and not really care about it? How could you not share the gospel truth with them? So it's a responsibility. And if you really do, think about it, if you really do love others, you know, as much as you love yourself, that, that second commandment that, that Jesus gave, you know, the first and greatest is, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind, and strength, and then to love others. If you really care about other people, then you're going to be sharing the gospel truth with them. So uh, it's, a, it's a huge betrayal on, on anyone's part not to share the gospel truth, but at the same time, be a little sensitive perhaps to the yeah. fact that this, this deacon, you know, these are new things to him. It was new things to all of us at one point in time. So uh, take the time to go through the scriptures with him. It, it, there will be perhaps that aha moment. It will, you know, sort of come upon him if he really looks at scripture as being the ultimate authority. Uh, it doesn't always happen right away, though, right when you want it to. So just be yeah. patient with them, pray with them, and just go over the scriptures. That's the best thing you could do. Amen. Yeah, you know, I've, uh, my pastor uh, preaches along the gospel biblically from, from the pulpit, and uh, he's even gone as far as to give the way of the master book to all of the families of the church from time to time. He'll slip gospel tracts mm -hmm. in, the, in the worship guides and you know, charge the people to go out and hand that out. And and uh, he's very uh, proactive in supporting me in, in my wow, evangelism what a effort. Blessing. It is. It took five years. Mm -hmm. it, it took it took five years and a lot of trial, a lot of error on my part. Mm -hmm. Having some, uh, I think, uh, now looking back, some unbiblical expectations of my pastor, but uh, the perseverance uh, by God's grace paid off. And mm -hmm. you know, my pastor is fully on board. We've now had four members of our little church uh, come through the Ambassadors Academy. So. So, Michael, and stick it out. Yeah, and they have a tough job, too. They're yeah. they, everybody's handing them books. Everybody's right. uh, asking them to look at this, and what do you think about that? And, uh, yeah, prayer certainly is a big part of yeah. it. Now, you know, Ray recently uh, put out uh, a book called God Has a Wonderful Plan for Your Life, uh, which is an excellent resource to uh, give to pastors and to uh, uh, deacons as well, members of your church. And, you know, don't approach them by, by throwing it down on their desk and say, hey, you need to read this and we need to start this on Monday. You know, uh, give it to them as, as a shepherd and say, Pastor, I've read this and I'd like you mm -hmm. to read it and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. I want to make sure I'm going in the right direction. P approach your pastor with humility and with respect and with love. And it's a book that he can devour, you know, in, in a day or two or less. And so it's not going to take him, you know, weeks of time to, to push through that. So that's available at livingwaters.com. So... All right, our next one is from Carrie. Uh, Carrie said, uh, today's program, March 8th, was very informative. Going to have to go back and look at that one so we could do that over and over again. Uh, the question I have is this. If a company rents a public space, does that space become private space for the length of time it's being rented out to the company? This is what a police officer told an open-air preacher to make them stop preaching. He also threatened to arrest them for trespassing. Was he correct? And can you inform me of our rights in a situation like this? Hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, I would say yes and no. Um, if uh, I've had this happen in downtown Los Angeles. There was a big NASCAR event at a, a car museum, and we went down there to do some evangelism, and we noticed that the public street was uh, taped off. Mm -hmm. uh, y the only way you could access that part of the public street was to go through the, the privately funded museum. I talked to one of the officers, and the organization had had gotten the permits and basically rented that block in downtown Los Angeles for this big event. So that made that block, during the time of that event, private property. And so those who were running the event 
uh, had the right to let in or out who they didn't want to. They could regulate uh, whether or not uh, tracks were handed out and what have you because for that time it was private property. Uh, the flip side of that is that if you're in a public park and an organization reserves a portion of a park, uh, they can't then say that the entire park is off limits. There has to be a clearly delineated uh, place for entry and exit uh, for people to come in and out, indicating that that area um, is uh, for private use. But yes, uh, city, county, state officials uh, can issue permits to deem certain parts of public property as private property for a time. If you refuse to leave, uh, when someone who is responsible for that area asks you to leave, then at least in California, technically that is a trespass, and yes, you could be arrested at that point. Hmm. Any thoughts on that, Scotty? You've run into stuff like uh, this yeah, before I many times. Yeah, I run into this all the time. Um, first of all, whether it's private or public property, it does not exclude the right um, to uh, the laws of the land, right. freedom of speech and those kinds of things. And uh, secondly, um, the, uh, you, have, you have a right. Uh, they can't, it, it, doesn't make the, it doesn't change the law in the sense, like now that it's private property, it's okay to murder. Yeah. <laughs> now that it's private property, it's okay to steal. N and we have uh, the same uh, rights. Prison and so rules. <laughs> they, can't, uh, they can't exclude us either. Yeah. Uh, I think Chad yeah, has something think? to say. Um, I had a question for you, Tony. Suppose yeah. this person, they don't want to get arrested. The police officer is threatening them with, you know, I'll arrest you. Uh -huh. But they do want to take it to the next step, the next level. Uh, what's the best thing they do? Is it is it contact the, the watch commander well, at the time? Uh, well, if, if, you're still there, if you're still there on the scene, so to speak, uh, what I would do is I would politely ask that officer to speak to their supervisor. And uh, ha now the officer can refuse to let you speak to a supervisor and say, no, I'm, I'm not getting my supervisor and I'm taking you to jail. I am the supervisor. I am the supervisor. Yeah, you might, <laughs> you might get that from time to time. I, I think the best course of action is to go ahead and leave and stay free to preach another day. Um, uh, contact the watch commander at the station. Make sure that uh, what you were being told was true. And uh, if you're still not satisfied at that point, you can contact an organization like the Alliance Defense Fund or ACLJ uh, to see if you can get some legal support that way. But there might be other times when you feel that uh, your rights are being violated in such an egregious way that you're going to make a stand at that point and be willing to go to jail because you don't think you should be... Uh, uh, hamstrung when you're trying to proclaim the gospel. It's a case-by-case -case situation. Uh, we've yeah. said this on the show before. Just make sure that your reason for being out there is the gospel and not simply out there to uh, further your rights as a citizen, uh, but because you're there to proclaim to the lost. Chad? We've actually utilized the Alliance Defense Fund before. Yeah. They, uh, they fought for us. And had I and not still been fighting for us. Yeah. Had I not been with, with you and, and known about the Alliance Defense Fund, I, I just would have had to have bitten the bullet and uh, probably paid up for uh, something that really wasn't a fault of our own. Right. Could you explain for the folks out there what the Alliance Defense Fund is? Well, the Alliance Defense Fund is a uh, private organization, a legal counsel. They are completely supported by... Uh, donations by uh, the giving of the body of Christ and they uh, supply pro bono uh, free uh, legal counsel and support in cases uh, around free free speech issues uh, First Amendment type issues issues that are uh, directly affecting uh, the body of Christ not only open-air preaching but assembly in uh, buildings uh, that sort of thing. And Outstanding organization. They're good advisors, too, because they, they have a, a, a real good sense of what works and what you can push. And, uh, you know, uh, just because uh, maybe we do have a right, it's not necessarily going to be the best move, and they right. can help you with that. Absolutely. Their uh, website is Alliance Defense Fund, all spelled out, one word, no spaces, alliancedefensefund.org. Org. All right, we got a few minutes left. Let's go to the chat room. Any questions coming in the chat room sure today? Sure thing. Chad? Do you get a better response from people coming in or out of the mall? Huh. What do you think, Scotty? Uh, you know, I don't do too much of that, but what I have done, I look for people that are sitting down or they're not on their way somewhere and uh, try to start up a conversation that way. Uh, in or out, 
Uh, no, I don't really hang by the entrance unless I've been kicked out. <laughs> but other than that, uh, I go in the mall. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, it's it's difficult when if when someone's coming into the mall, they're unless they're a kid who are, who are there just to hang out. They're on a mission. They want to go shopping. They want to get out. If they're right. coming out, they want to go home. They don't want to hang around. So, yeah, I would agree. Look for those people who are just milling about, sitting at a Starbucks, a food court, mm -hmm. something like and that. And sometimes there's benches outside sure. at the front, people waiting to get picked up. That's a great opportunity. Yeah. Chad, what do you think? I, I think it is best to catch those people that are just kind of milling about, meandering around. They're, they're definitely easier to stop and talk to. But if you see somebody on the move, and this is actually something I got to do today with Ray, there's a guy that was on a skateboard. He's skateboarding by, he's on a cell phone, and uh, we wanted to talk to him because he looked like an interesting fella. So I go running after him, and I let him know, hey, we're looking for a guy on a skateboard and a cell phone. Would yeah. you be interested in doing an interview? He stops. He's like, yeah, bro, I'll do an interview. Yeah. I mean, it's that easy. So, I mean, if you see a person wearing a red cap and white sneakers or they got the diamond earrings in, hey, I'm looking for somebody that's wearing diamond earrings and you know, you kind of yeah. have at it from there. You know, and, and I'll, I'll testify to that as well. When I when I first heard Ray do that, I thought that's just vintage Ray comfort, you know, and it only works for Ray because everything seems to work for Ray. You know, I, I, some of the things that Ray gets away with, I would be in a fight, I yeah. think, if I said some of those things. I just noticed something. You have more hair than I do. I, I, I need a hair. Well, you know what? It's getting real long. I trimmed the mustache. I and don't the like gonna, that. I'm going to have to get a toupee well, Scott, uh, next you know, time I come I was home, I'm so. sorry. I was out open air preaching. I, I you know failed what? to get Ray a haircut has, this weekend. Ray has a really nice toupee. Maybe I'll... Oh! <laughs> did you see that line? <laughs> Ta -da, ja it's a big one, yeah. The views expressed by Stuart Scott do not necessarily reflect the views of Living Waters or their affiliates. I got to keep my job for crying uh, out loud. You're telling the boss has a toupee. Yeah. That's Ron. Ron has the toupee. Yeah, the um, big one. <laughs> wow. Ray laughed. Ron's not laughing. It's an app But, you know, we were, we were out at Cerritos College today, and I approached a uh, 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 couple kids, James and Susie, and Susie was wearing a Hello Kitty shirt. And don't ask me how I know that, but uh, I have three daughters. Okay, mm -hmm. enough said. And I said, uh, you know what? I'm looking for someone wearing a white Hello Kitty shirt today to interview. And that got him to stop. And uh, it turned out to be the best conversation of that afternoon. They yeah. were very contrite and... Mm. Uh, so, yeah, use stuff like that. All right, we got time for at least one more. Okay. Uh, first, you know what, though? First, let's uh, announce the giveaways. Winner. Yeah, sure. Uh, winner number one, Josh and Amanda Taylor. Uh, number two, Jan Howard. And three, Wally Austin. And where are they from? They're from they come from a state of joy and happiness. <laughs> Maine, Oregon. <laughs> I'm not going to play that <laughs> okay, game. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, and, and for the record, Ron doesn't have a toupee either. No one here, I don't think anyone here. Has a no, toupee. not no. that I know of. No. If, right. I, if I find out, I'll let you know. That's right. Stay tuned. You'll want to come back just for that. All right. One more question from the chat room. Yeah, I suppose this is a question that we're all going to have to uh, sort of deal with at one time or another. The death of a loved one is a terrible and tragic thing. How do I continue to share the gospel and remain sensitive to their loss? Wow. Good question. Um, We've talked about this. Uh, we've talked about this before on the on the program. I think uh, one of the best things to do is, as quickly as you can, take the conversation off the loved one who has passed and put it on them. And and one of the ways that I I do that is is I'll say you know I don't um, I don't I didn't know your loved one. I ran into this a lot as a chaplain. I was called out to to houses where you know people had died or accidents or uh, whether violent or otherwise and. And uh, they would ask me, you know, where is my loved one now? Well, I, ha not knowing the person, I have no way of knowing that. You know, I do and have something that I, I say quickly. I said, you love, you love that person, right? Uh, I, I talked to a trucker once who had lost his daughter. And I, uh, uh, and I said, you loved it. Loved it. And he said, oh, yeah, like nobody else. And, and that's why you're so grieved, right? And I told him, I said, nobody loved your daughter more than God. And now she's in the hands of God. She couldn't be in a better uh, place as far as somebody who cares. But you've got to worry about you. You're still alive. And uh, you've yet to go. And so it's just like you say. You shift the conversation to somebody else. But it seems to be a comfort to let people know or to remind them, really, that God loves and cares for every person much more than you do, it, even if it's a son yeah. or a daughter. And one of the things I'll, I'll say along those lines is that, you know, if your loved one could say anything to you right now, it would be don't, don't miss heaven. 
Mm. So whether or not that person is now facing eternal judgment or that person is now facing eternal joy in heaven, right. it would be the same. You know, whether they're the rich man with Lazarus or whether they're someone who is in heaven, they would say to their loved ones, don't miss heaven. Mm. And, uh, you know, with that, you need to go out and proclaim the gospel to somebody. Uh, 150,000 people die every day. The vast majority of them will miss heaven. Untold number of thousands of people uh, lost their lives almost instantly this last weekend in the horrific tragedy in Japan. We need to go out and share the gospel with people as if lives depend on it because lives do depend on it. There's nothing more loving you will ever do than proclaim the gospel to someone who is lost and bound for hell. Uh, one uh, quick programming note, daylight savings time here in uh, Southern California this last weekend. So if... Uh, if uh, you're just tuning in and uh, you're late or you're early, wherever you are around the world, uh, right now it is noon Pacific Standard Time here you in California. Uh, but you can always watch it again on YouTube, Light Source, One Place, places where we're archiving the program. And uh, But we're out of time. So, Scotty, thanks for being with us today. Oh, Thank you very pleasure. much. Look Thank forward to having you for back. Having me. And on behalf of Scotty and Chad, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. Proclaim the gospel. See you tomorrow. Amen. Living Waters presents On the Box.